What's good everybody, it's your boy Jetski Chuck back with another creepy and scary TikTok reaction video. If you haven't already, smash that like and subscribe button. We're on these Tartarian waters, you're gonna love it. It's a banger on prom. Let's go. How you can- Friends, family, and loved ones again. I just wanted to bring your attention to some information that's being provided about Tartarians and the great cathedrals that were allegedly Gothic and Renaissance period, horse and buggy, yada, yada. But they had these huge, massive fireplaces everywhere. And um, what we're learning now is they were operated by radium. I had originally supposed that the uh, rebar was somehow be able to heat it. I mean, we know how they cool these big, huge places um, but they had these massive fireplaces that were had these uh, these andirons here at the bottom we'll get into. You notice the Florida Lee. But how did they heat these massive rooms? And we're learning now it's through radium. Um, I thought it was heating up the rebar, but no, this is this is using X radium heaters. And they sold them. You can get the old Sears and Roebuck mag magazines and see they're selling radium foot warmers and radium this and radium that. And then these huge fireplaces, how do they heat these huge rooms? Again, there's no fireplace here. This is all sealed, and this is very common in the ancients. These are called andirons, and this, this is what they ran on in this area here. They would generate heat throughout the entire room. And you see these huge, big, elaborate fireplaces all over, and then they have these two, um, two uh, andirons here at the bottom. And this is the Chateau de Fenelon. And you see example, example, example now. And it looks like um, this group has, has, has broken the code to understand how these operate and how these work um, in these massive fireplaces. Um, so Gothic iron fire, and ornate, ornate, ornate. No, these were operated on radium. And the radium <clears throat> would heat the whole house. Like nuclear radiation, notice the sign there, just like nuclear radiation as well. So heating these all up. And then some of the comments here. Um, my brother used to sell heat rods and worked in a similar way, conducting heat from the ether inside the house. So they're literally just tapping outside the ether to get the radium, radium, the secret of life. Just like red mercury runs the, um, red mercury runs the, um, copper domes and red mercury is alternating current um, and uh, quicksilver it's also called so that's another reason we don't see all, there's all these quicksilver mines I learned about in California um, meet the amazing sight the world destroyed before your eyes a radium scope so radium is something that is another hidden technology hidden knowledge natural recurring source that we have available um, to heat all the homes and to heat these massive massive, massive cathedrals um, that had these andirons at the bottom that were, were used were radium and, and they would heat you know, grab the ether from the outside and heat the rooms. And the way they used air conditioning was they built a couple levels below the ground and they literally would just open the vents. Heat rises, right? So you got the cold air down below. So you just open the vents in your rooms and everywhere and you got instant air conditioning. So they had heat and they had air conditioning and it was all free, cheap, and everyone had access to it. So I just thought you'd find this interesting. And uh, don't you find it interesting that radium, the chemical symbol, is Ra? What is Ra? That's the Apollo, the male god, Ra. And it's radium, natural occurring radioactive metal, uh, radionuclide formed of the decay of uranium and thorium in the environment. Now remember uranium-235? That was <laughs> That was what they were using in the nuclear bombs and stuff, they allegedly said, but... We know that's not true because the nuclear bombs <laughs> don't exist. But this is also to hide radium and to hide the fact that uh, radium is available and can heat all the homes and heat everywhere we want because it can tap into the ether and, and uh, create uh, uh, free energy, free heat. And as far as the mercury goes, this is from my book um, about California mercury contamination because they were harvesting mercury for this free energy in California. And you can see the mercury is still contaminating many of the areas, silent spring contamination. Um, but yeah, mercury was very important for their uh, development in the quicksilver. 
And then south of San Jose, they had a huge quicksilver. 1845, they had a huge quicksilver mine. And the, actually, the island, when California was an island, the land between the Sierra Nevadas and California was called the Red Sea. And um, so this is with the quicksilver, red mercury. California mercurized produced roughly half the world's supply for the energy. And then you can see the quicksilvers here. So here's the antenna, the resonator, uh, the resonator. And then the red mercury, and mercury just with with the heat, with energy, just moves, so it creates the alternating current. And then you have the copper domes, and you have the magnets on each side, and voila, free energy for all, folks. Free energy for all. And this is where Almaden is where Silicon Valley is. So what Quicksilver was for free energy in the mercury mines here, it became Silicon Valley, so Silicon computers, that kind of thing. So just a little bit of history, history for you. Uh, but again, the production, 28,000 flasks of red mercury, 50,000 produced worldwide in 1851. So this was the free energy they used, the quicksilver from California, once they got into California, to take over and, and, and to um, put out the free energy everywhere. And here you can see, this is, uh, I think, somewhere in China. Um, you can see the, the free energy working. You see these collectors here at the top, they're being energized, and there's the energy harvesting from the ether, and they're bringing it down to earth here, and you can just see the energy being fluctuated here in this picture. It zaps on and zaps off. So these are energy collections, all these spires, these towers that you see going up on all these capital buildings, these churches and whatnot. These were... Um, free energy harvesting centers. And just to close, um, this is a residence that was built in 1880s in Eureka, California. Um, and Eureka, um, I found it gold. So this mansion was built in the 1883s and my son and I went up to Humboldt County up to Eureka to check it out. So I'll just play this, but you can see where the free energy devices are also in these buildings back then. And then who had the craftsmanship to build this during the gold rush and the lumber lo logging uh, on top of it? Can you see the Wi-Fi? See that up there, Jackson? See the Wi-Fi? See, see the very top? I'm gonna zoom in there and see those wires sticking out. That's your free energy, right there. That's your free energy right there. That's how they got the free energy for the buildings. That's how the Tartarians did it. Beautiful. And then talking with this gentleman. Cool was that actually seeing that building in China actually harvesting the ether. That was a gem showing you it still works. You could see the electric electricity getting pulled in from the building. That's free energy for that entire building. Who knows how else? And I'll tell you another thing. All older buildings. You're all under suspect now. We're on to you. If it was an 1800 building and older, chances are that boy was generating energy. Look at the top. Look at for the copper peaks and look for that giant antenna. Even in your downtown homes, it can be an old home anywhere. I'm telling you, anywhere you look, an older home, chances are them boys was generating ether. Alright guys, we've been to a lot of different old world places on my channel, but I finally made my way into the actual Parthenon that most people actually think wasn't the real Parthenon, but I'm in, under a deeper inclination when you really look into old, the old world in and of itself. Here we have it. Statue of the Sina. Just to give a size comparison, look at that lady compared to that right there. That's Nike. She's holding in her right hand. I love hearing all the people chatter around me talking about, you know, Greek gods and goddesses and all these different mainstream stories, but they're not even looking into the old world aspects whatsoever. And they don't even really realize what they're looking at. 
Shield of Athena, 15 feet in diameter. It's hard to put that in perspective on this phone, but that thing is absolutely massive, guys. The structure in itself is just as impressive as, uh, as Athena. The doors right there are perfectly balanced. You see that gentleman standing next to him. They're locked right now, but perfectly balanced doors. Six four. That's how tall Nike is. Get some reference of how big that is. Is that made out of real gold? Battle of the Gods and Giants. Tell you a lot without telling you a lot, right, guys? They tell you a lot. Without telling you a lot, man, I love how he said that. That was perfect. Shout out to Ball Out Truth 92 for that video, man. That w I didn't even know that thing existed or was even out. Who do you think made that is my question. And is it made out of gold? Your comments below. So, people, this is the golden statue. If you guys don't know what the golden statue is, and this is the first video you ever seen from your boy, the golden statue was actually in the world fair. It was damn near the centerpiece. Where it's at now, I don't know. I think it's in Chicago, but this is a giant solid piece of gold statue. I wonder who made this one as well. And what they show online is always the front, but they never show the rear part. On the rear, if you look closely, it says the World's Columbian Exposition authorized by Act of Congress and generously participated in by the nations of the earth was held here in 1893 to celebrate the 400 year anniversary of the discovery of America on this site stood the administration building. Now, why they use 400 years from 1492? Because 400 years uh, celebrates the conquering of the last Moorish stronghold empire. Again, exposition meaning inquisition, uh, conquest. So, but on the front of this, it's called the Republic. So people, this- All right, guys, this was the golden statue. Um, I believe this is the World Fair. And this was way back. This is what he was talking about before. Let's check out these ancient photos.
this man it screams ancient rome right and that's what we're seeing is is almost the passing of the torch from rome to the new rome mm -hmm. which is going to be america and we're going to see roman symbolism throughout columbia is one of them she is uh you know, the golden lady of the, it was 65 feet tall. And supposedly she was made of all gold, whether it was gold leaf or solid gold, you'll get different differing opinions. Now, what's interesting about it is supposedly at the end of the fair, they lit her on fire and burned her down. Mm. And it was almost like a symbolic ritual. Yeah. Like Bohemian Grove or something. Yeah. Where all the giants have gone. They used to be everywhere. Have you ever wondered where all the giants have gone? They used to be everywhere, walking this earth. But now, you don't see them. Remember, there was a time where everything grew big due to the amount of oxygen that the giant trees used to produce. But as you know, they chopped them all down. And anybody still capable of growing big gets labeled with having a disease. They call it giantism. They get prescribed medicine, more like poison, which stops their growth. And I always find it funny that they could tell you what dinosaurs was eating and what they looked like five million years ago. But like, was you even there though, bruv? And some of you may not be aware, but any so-called dinosaur bones that they do find, they only find pieces. Most of that skeleton what you see there are reconstructed fake bones. But anytime they do find any real giant bones, Spessodium comes in and destroys them. But in the 1600s, the Spanish did capture a two-headed giant, and that is still on display. But like most facts of history, they still don't teach you the truth. Have you ever wondered where all the giants have gone? That lady was huge. You see how big she was? She was holding that baby like this on her hand. It was huge. These airships was putting in work, I'm trying to tell you. Wow, look at this. They're dropping down like a parachute to light the soldiers or something. What type of light could power that? That is interesting. So oh, much of Great Tartaria has disappeared. The incredible looking Tartarian griffin is used on the coat of arms of the Crimean Republic in Western Russia and the Alte Republic in Southern Russia. Additionally, the Tartarian griffin is used as the griffin flag for the town of Verka Yea Pishima in the Verdslovska Oblast in Western Russia. Among the most destructive astra or pointed stick were, was the advanced device known as the Brahmastra, the infinite reality pointed stick which had apparently been created by the Hindu Indian deity called Brahma Ishvara. From what has been mentioned in the Hindu scripture, the device was described as a single projectile charged with all the power in the universe. It was an unknown weapon, an iron thunderbolt. And an that reminds me of the iron rod in the Bible. Seeing this, I'm just putting the similarities two and two together. You know, as soon as they're talking about this thing with this immense power, it seems like an iron rod. It's mentioned in the Bible. Enormous messenger of death, which reduced to ashes an entire race. There was neither a counterattack nor a defense that could stop it. Enthralled by the Bhagavad Gita or song from the creator, the Vedic Hindu Indian scripture that was written around 1760 BC. Julius Robert Oppenheimer began Sanskrit studies so he could read the text in the Sanskrit language. 
While he was a professor before World War II, he has known to quote numerous passages from the Mahabharata or Great Being Maintained. He would do this in every class lecture. The Great Exhibition. How intelligent was Oppenheimer? He learned the whole language just so he could translate the original manuscripts. That's what I want to do. I want to learn Paleo Hebrew so I can translate the old manuscripts myself. You know, that was intelligence. And I don't know if you guys seen the movie Oppenheimer. It has a few weird scenes in it. But I like how at the end, spoiler alert, they kind of alluded to Operation Fishbowl when he was talking to Albert Einstein. If you if you look listen to what they said and watch what they're doing at the very end of the video for entertainment purposes only, don't come for me. But it looks like they were on Operation Fishbowl and Operation Dominic at the end. What are they really trying to do with the firmament? They showed you. Was to showcase the wonders of new technology. The great exhibition was to showcase the wonders of new technology. The Hold on, I'm just going to catch you guys up a little bit. I did see this one before I watched it, but you guys heard of the old the old world fairs. Now this was a giant exhibition that took place and um he's going to tell you where it took place, but it was in in a different country or something. But anyways, this was a giant world fair that took place, but there was also a giant expedition. This is what this video is about. Industrial Revolution had made United Kingdom the world leaders in mass industrialization. The Great Exhibition was held in Hyde Park, Central London in 1851. Apparently, the construction of the Great Exhibition or Crystal Palace Exhibition began in 1850. Yet again, the vast and highly ornate structures were seemingly built very quickly and with tremendous efficiency, just like the other world fairs around the planet. The different plans and proposals were initiated from the 15th of March 1850 and construction was completed for the opening of the festival on the, for the 1st of May 1851. History has been... Huge shout out to Zachary Denman for that content. If you guys want to check him out, I highly recommend you do so. His name is Zachary Denman. I'll put a link to his videos in the comments. ...has been largely fabricated and is now a subject of mundane information which does not educate the masses. But the reason there is so much confusion, depression and sadness in the world is because we have been consistently deceived and most do not even care as they are so intensely programmed to accept the distortions and lies that are given to them. We have been educated with what someone wants us to believe, but not what we are supposed to factually believe, which is the truth. A lot of individuals have lost themselves and forgotten who they actually are. So by remembering what these buildings were truly used for by the Tartarians or the old world, we can begin to remember our true potential. So the question is, what actually was Great Tataria? Well, it was two things. One, it was a geographic uh, delineated uh, landmass, which was predominantly across northern Russia. And that would include the Kola Peninsula, which is where the Mamansk Oblast is today in northwestern Russia. And obviously the Polar Ural Mountains, the northern Ural Mountains of north central Russia and the Yakutsk Peninsula, right the way northward from the Sea of Japan up in northeastern Russia and obviously including Siberia, that the, the far Russian east uh, as it's known today. So it was a vast geographic extent and expanse. And at the same time as that, it was also a culturally based civilization. So great Tataria in terms of the Tatarian architecture, its music, um, the various processes they used. Because it, it would seem they go back to as far as like when the Vamanas and the old 
techs and these old technologies that are around. So tell us more. I think if you go back to um, what history won't accept is the the unofficial uh, founding date of the development and the emergence of Great Tataria on the 16th of February, 458 BC. And then its actual further scientific development, really, which was the time when many of these rudimentary airships were actually starting to be commercially manufactured across Great Tataria in northern Russia from the 4th of October 1586. So, you know, during that time, we're talking about the medieval period. In terms of what Western science is going to say, they're going to say that's absolute nonsense, that's ludicrous conspiracy theories. So if we look over the span of generations, many of these Nordic Tatarians or Tatarian Aryans constructed the luminescent cities such as Molgom, Bayada, Kambulik and Bagu in northern Tataria. And the scientists in those various cities were manufacturing the cymatic-based occult technology. So obviously this was for healing purposes and the healing temples that were eventually repurposed as chapels, churches and cathedrals, not just in parts of what is the Russian Federation today, but across the Caucasus region, Eastern Europe, Western Europe. Guys, I, I try not to stop it, but did you see that last building? Caucasus region, Eastern Europe, Western this Europe, one. North America. Last this is incredible too, man. This building is incredible in america and so forth and what they were doing also was developing different types of anti-gravity based look at the ceiling man What's, what happened where, where where did we go wrong occult technology for the purposes of levitating stone blocks and brick and uh, very heavy uh, construction materials that could be used in the development and of their own you know buildings across their towns actually repurposed as chapels churches and cathedrals not just this building this is the building i wanted to see why have we stopped building this this was this building if i'm looking at this and i had to take a guess man this thing had to be made probably about 900 years ago 900 years ago look how look at the copper the work you would need a crane nowadays if you asked us to make this now you would need probably two cranes some industrial sized powered vehicles running on gasoline to make this they made this 900 years ago wow ah. Look at how tiny the people are, you know? So for something this massive, it just, it blows my mind. Either they had some type of some, they were using some type of vibration to levitate these pieces, some type, either that, or they had a portal that they were transferring the pieces. But even if they had the portal, how could they place pieces on top? So they had to have a portal and some type of levitation technology they had to have a portal and some type a portal and some type of levitation technology and it had to be a giant for entertainment purposes only you would need two big boys to be like all right man we got y'all want this here all right <laughs> set it there i don't know nobody knows you got all these people trying to dissect and figure this out talking about tartaria nobody knows how this stuff got built and it was done fast it's not like they're like all right we can take our time with chisel stack a whole bunch of blocks together as best we can and chisel this out no this was done in six months federation today but across the caucasus region eastern europe western europe north america latin america and so forth and what they were doing also was developing different types of anti-gravity based occult technology for the purposes of levitating stone blocks and brick and uh, very heavy uh, construction materials that could be used in the development and 
I got to talk to this dude, Stefan Denman, writer slash researcher. Man, he might be the coldest person on this Tartaria tech. If you thought I was tight, this is the dude that's, you know, I, I ain't going to lie. I get into the Mercury rectifiers, you know, I'm, hey, your boy, Jesky Chuck on the Mercury rectifiers. But my man right here, as far as breaking down civilizations and the technology and the, the architecture, man, this dude is out cold. We need to get a live going or something. Where is he? Of their own, you know, buildings across their towns and cities. And then the actual usage of them was repurposed from something that was rather peaceful to do with leisure time and holidays, a, a form of social tranquility and, you know, a, a sort of a, a, a sky based adventure for Nordic Tatarians. I mean, you just um, a look at the contrast of what went on. So you take these beautiful um, airships, and we know that they had specific names for these in Tataria, for example. You know, they, the actual airships were given uh, different names, such as the, the Howie Gamila, or airships, also known as the Asma Gamila, or of sky ships. They were also known as the Havig Gamila, or again. All right, I got to interrupt because I got something important to say. That's why we don't see the Tartarians anymore. They didn't built all those ships and like, man, y'all want Russia? Y'all can have this, man. We didn't found something above, the, beyond the ice. There's land beyond it, and it was like, man, we about to go beyond the ice and start a whole new civilization, man. Y'all fighting about this stuff in Russia and all that, man. Y'all can have this. We're gone. You don't need gasoline or you know whatever type of fossil fuel we're using now to travel around they were just in the atmosphere traveling off the ether so who knows how far they can go they can definitely go past beyond the ice wall the elements aren't affecting them if you go beyond the clouds all that cold and all those elements that people go through is that's done that's under the clouds all you got to do is stay warm and make sure your oxygen right and it looks like they had that they, they, they were ready they mass produced those ships, man. They're gone. It's like y'all can Russia, y'all can have this. We're tired of fighting the China, fighting China off on the Great Wall of Tartaria. We're, we're tired of fighting them off. We're tired of people taking our ideas and making us move and stuff, man. We're gone. Airships and also known as the Gok Gamila or Sky Ships. And there was maybe 25, 30, maybe 35 or more different kind of aerodynamic design before we move on they had over 30 different designs of ships back then they were busy i should have made an airship for this video man that's hey be on the lookout for another one man it's that it take a lot of work on your boy you know making them airships i mean making a submarine i don't know how many y'all saw the last video with the submarine that took a lot of work, but be expecting the airship video coming out soon because I'm not done. You guys said they said they have 25 different styles of airships. Oh, we're going to find them. Not on this episode, but best believe on another episode, we're going to dive in on those. About the technology and what Tartaria or the old world, what sort of technology they were using. And talk about these free energy-based systems, these somatic-based systems. Let's talk a little bit about that, first of all. Okay, so if you go back to the old world order of Great Tataria in northern Russia, they were using, obviously, um, basically somatic-based occult technologies that were drawing down telluric electricity from the atmosphere above the towns and cities of Great Tataria. So obviously they had sp spires, they had domes, these had metal strips that would then run down these buildings into the capacitors in the basement levels of many of these premises, some of which were going to the ground level. And then any excess amounts of this telluric electricity, telluric in the sense of that it's interconnecting with the geomagnetic ley lines, that pretty much all the buildings in all the towns and cities of Great Dataria. But then you take a look, for example, at the work of Leonardo da Vinci and what you were discussing with the various drawings that he did. Where did that come from? You know, mm. I mean, he had a drawing of what appeared to be a helicopter and I think a submarine as well. So where mm, did that? That's right. Yeah, you did. Yeah. yeah, where did that information come from? Well, you have to remember the Jesuit order 
of the Roman Catholic Church and the Vatican City State in Italy it was fully part, obviously, what went on in Central America and South America with the Spanish conquistadors, you know, and the various European monarchs. And th that was really about removing occult technology that had been commonplace amongst the Aztecs and the Inca and the Toltecs and the Mayans. Mm. And obviously what went on, you know, this, you know, in South America was very similar, especially in countries like Brazil and Argentina and Chile. If you look at those giant antenna structures, that makes you wonder about what the Eiffel Tower was really working on. Because if you take a look at the Eiffel Tower, if you ask me, that's just a giant conducting building. We don't know how long the Eiffel Tower has been there. But if you ask me, there's a giant structure under for entertainment purposes only. Don't come for me. And if there is my bad exposing y'all but if you look at the eiffel tower that's a giant conduct conductive antenna so who knows what's up under that boy what type of ether they're generating what type of research they're doing what type of old world technology is going on but that eiffel tower i'm telling you there's that's a giant conductive boy just like the rest of these we're going through that's been on top of these giant gold pillars I'm telling y'all The actual crystal glass windows in these cymatic based healing temples also use refined macro crystalline substances that included diaphanite, which is also known as clear quartz, amethyst, which is known as also purple quartz, uh, galazine, which is also known as blue quartz, uh, uh, coconite, which is also known as red quartz, or most people recognize it as ruby. You mm. also have citrine, which is also called yellow quartz. You have uh, galactodite, which is also known as milky quartz. Rosine, which is known as pink quartz. And lastly, prasiolite, which is known as green quartz. So they were experts in the use of a purified crystallic production in order to create these beautifully uh, perfected and very ornate geometric colored stained glass windows to ensure specific types of wavelengths of photons or light. But what we know is that there were actually the archaeological. This dude is spitting. This man, this is sacred wisdom for real. Shout out to the Sacred Wisdom podcast. My man right here, he is cutting up. He's letting it all go. Remains of Hyperborean pyramids that mm. have been found, by the way, by various Russian archaeologists and, and other researchers in the Russian Federation in that area around the perimeter of the Gobi Desert. So we know that these Hyperborean pyramids, they were granite based. They were known as the Shining Pyramids. Uh, you know, they existed there or crystal pyramids. And we have to remember the word crystal from crystallos in the Greek language actually means solidified light or frozen light. That's actually oh. its etymology. <laughs> and that's really what a crystal is. It's literally like light that is almost slowed down and captured in some kind of rudimentary geometric structure. Mm. So the, these pyramids were generating huge amounts of transmitted telluric electricity they were basically power based, but Western science does not want to accept. Did you hear that? He said telluric electricity. I never heard that before. Except no. that a, there was some kind of Arctic North Polar region based civilization that we can call Hyperborea, where there was an eternal spring, mm. which really meant there was a, a 12 month all year round temperate climate it was never there wasn't sub-zero temperatures they didn't have a distinct 12-month period with spring and summer and autumn and winter mm. we know that the hyperboreans you know were connected to what were known as the hyperborean giants or the the cyclopean giants of hyperborea so yes. we have to postulate the idea were the actual forefathers and foremothers of the nordic hyperboreans were they 12 foot to 14 foot high you know hyperborean giants polar region based 
civilization that we can call hyperborea well, right, i wanted to rewind spring, this because he showed really um, some important a, a stuff i never seen in high quality if we fast forward to this building right here shout out to cultivate the elect i remember him showing a creepy and scary TikTok where they were referring to these as actual portals so who knows what type of technology that they were generating to make these become portals where was the other portal to i don't know you know but they were calling these bad boys portals don't take my word for it i'm not trying to waste your time look it up these creepy and scary TikToks might just they will change our reality i'm not gonna lie i won't go by any all of you go downtown and start looking at them buildings and look at the tops of them you gonna be like, man, that was an ancient Tartarian building. Somebody that has at least is the archetype that has the architecture of an old Tartarian building with the the Greek pillars and the fancy art on the top. And then normally it's a copper dome with some type of electricity right there. That's the blueprint. And they everywhere. They just it's low key with it. They didn't got rid of rid of most of them. But I'm telling you, if you go downtown all of you it don't matter where you live at i guarantee you there's going to be at least one or two of those buildings capital buildings uh this is for entertainment purposes but uh the capital buildings any type of legislative building any type of you know building that you don't want to go to to handle work so that i think that's the vibe they're trying to give off oh these people are just going to go and get their work handled they're not going to really care about what the scenery looks like like that door on kansas i'll go back and show you that door at kansas kansas those two giant doors in kansas people walk right past those two giant doors all the time and nobody let's go to it man because i don't know some of y'all returning viewers some of y'all new I, i'm trying to catch y'all up man let's go back shout out to cultivate the elect while we were on this topic on Tartaria, we're talking about the portal buildings. This is what I'm talking about. Look at that detail. I mean, can you really believe that these things were built up that fast? And just kind of, they just kept throwing up buildings. I mean, they must have been like the Energizer Bunny, just building things so fast that we can't even comprehend that they can build entire cities like that. While being in a survival state. And somebody just said the Palace of Fine Arts. Yes, that's what that was. And here you go. Another San Francisco. Looks exactly like Chicago. Looks exactly like St. Louis. Exactly like New York City. Exactly like South Carolina. The people who attended. Got all those people. I mean, look at that. These are massive buildings. And what's interesting is when you go through this book, you see that all of those buildings are called portals. Portals of this Portals of that, portals of this, portals of that. The name portal is very common. And all of these things, when you start to look at the design in all of these cities, they do look somewhat like portals where you would go and you would kind of go through something. So you have to sit there and go, when you look at the history lessons in which we have been sold with horse and wagon, that's not the timeline in which was taking place at this time. But then, as they destroyed a lot of stuff, then, they started teaching us something new, that a bunch of people on horse and wagon were just roaming across, building all this, building across the frontier from another end. There's definitely some validity, a lot of validity, if you ask me personally, that what he's talking about and what's adding on to the, up to this Tartaria. Shout out to Cultivate the Light. Now there's another building, there's something else I was um, alluding to, the ancient tartarian buildings in everyone's town and cities they're there trust me like people ignore them all the time they walk right by them because it's normally an important building that you don't want to be there long you got to handle business you're not really going to pay attention to the surroundings like that or they just gave why they chose those buildings i don't know but let me show you what i'm talking about all right guys i got a treat for you it took me a little bit to find this video um this door shows you how these old Tartarian buildings get right are thrown right in front of your face in your own hometown. I don't care where you live. Um, you you name it, I guarantee you, you're going to find at least one or two of these buildings in your home city. 
Look at this, for example. They throw it right in front of your face. 10th and Baltimore here in Kansas City in the downtown. And right behind me is the building. It says at the top over the entrance, New England National Bank. And I'm going to turn around. And this building is right across from the historic library and straight up the street from a really incredible building. But I want to stay on to this building right now because the front door is amazing. And you can see, of course, we've got a lower level here and an angled level as the street goes along. And what were lower windows, that one's boarded up. But the door is really incredible. I want to give you an idea of how high it is. Six feet is right about to the bottom of that circle on the door. And you can see how high that goes. And these doors are like iron, solid iron. These buildings are in your hometown. I can't stress it enough. When you're traveling, when you're when you're in a different state or city, you know, these creepy TikToks, they will change your reality because I'm telling you. Or they just not, the videos ain't going hard enough. But the videos I'm dropping, man, these boys, I'm telling you, these are everywhere. Up here, now that's as high as I can reach. It's about nine feet. These doors are at least... 15 feet high and to even put them in place would have taken a crane basically to haul those in place and they put you know, spikes to keep the birds from landing right there but then these lamps to either side are really incredible also it really doesn't look like there was anywhere to light those lamps. This building would have been built. On the notion that they were gas lit, that you would have had to light this is what every they need night. To be teaching their schools. And just to give you a, a look at the scale of that building, it's red brick above. This is a, obviously a facade that's been put on down below. And one of you guys said something very important. I don't know which one of you guys said it, but you guys said the red brick might have contained mercury. And if it did, that was excellent of you to say, because that could be another resource that they could have used to harness that ether. Because I do believe a recent study by scientists said that red brick can be energized. Hey, I'm not trying to waste you time, waste your time. Uh, do the research yourself. You'll see what I'm talking about. Well, I'm not trying to waste your time. Like, you do not see doors like that anymore. Th this door, you can see from the side, there's a screw. And, I mean, I can't, I'm not, I'm not even budging it by pushing on it. It's just incredible. Then straight across the street, it's the incredible library, which says First National Bank, with a massive safe in the basement. And the interesting thing about the door on it is it looks like it originally had doors like that also. Well, it's, they're still there. But that the inner part, the ones that they utilize now, are just makeshift doors that were put there later. Because these doors are the same. And I would say that they're even taller. And you can see this, th this that I'm holding right there weighs, oh, probably 15, over 15 pounds, just that. And the feel of that door that is solid. feels like it would weigh maybe a thousand. You ever look at that door? These doors are incredible. Well, pick that up and feel. You hear him? He said, you ever look at that door? 
This is the whole reason I played this video. Cause look at this dude. He walks right past it. Like it's nobody's business. People and people just don't care. They like, man, I'm, I'm trying to get, I don't even know what I'm going to eat today. I got bills. I got to pay rents due. You know, I don't feel the best. So the last thing I'm concerned about is some doors on the side of me, man. Watch out, move. I got somewhere to go. I, I get it. But, but hey, you've been lied to. It's an important lie that's going on here. You know, it's they're lying to us. What do you think it's made out of? Brass. This brass, look at that. It is. Look, it's shining out of this brass. Yeah. Just this doorway. How how could they ever manufacture this in a time when they say they only had a horse and a buggy? Or build this building? Yeah, oh yeah, I'm, I'm always fascinated. What do you say? Yeah. See that door across the street? I would love to hear uh explanation. If if you if you you know think you know it and you you know that well, well technically uh they had a horse and buggy and a lever pull system that was able to uh winch the door up on one side uh 10 people used their strength together to use the pulley and rope system and then we got it perfectly hey you can miss me with all that but i love to hear you try and and see how humans could have possibly did it on horse and buggy technology go look at it closely you want me to tell you a secret? There's those that say. Look how he got closer. He was like, sure. What, what, what was the secret? But I look around. I tried you. But that's. You know, down there? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, I love the city. I was born here 61 years ago. You want me to tell you a secret? Yeah. There's those that say that these buildings have been here. For hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and that there was a flood that came in of mud that covered them up and that's why you see windows on the sidewalk that went lower originally they were much higher no, that could be oh excuse me well I, I don't know see look you see that lady walking by she probably just was being polite trying to get out the way but people don't think twice they got other stuff they worried about these giant doors on the side of this building boy move i don't got time for that what do you think about that? Yeah, because you look at up there. I mean, look, every so many feet, there's cow cow. They can't even build. You can't, they can't even build that now. All right, all right, y'all. Sorry, I I went on a little rant tangent. We went sideways a little bit talking about the portals and the Kansas door. My bad. I get excited, but it was an important fact that I was trying to bring and show you guys. But let's continue on with this creepy and scary TikTok reaction video. connected to what were known as the hyperborean giants or the the cyclopean giant damn this video is already an hour long man i wasn't trying to make these boys long man i'm trying to do 25 26 27 minute boys like everyone else man but you know i we we be on these waters and once we get on these waters it is no turning back giants i don't do one hour to everyone watching these i don't do one hour videos on purpose that's just how they end up we got some stuff we got to get off our chest man of hyperborea so yeah. we have to postulate the idea were the actual forefathers and foremothers of the nordic hyperboreans were they 12 foot to 14 foot high you know hyperborean giants the schematics or the blueprints or templates for that those types of occult technology had really come from great tataria and obviously before great tatar we go back as you know we've discussed in some detail in a, in a previous sacred wisdom podcast to the time of the civilization of the scythian aryans mm. and before then the civilization of hyperborea that was so prevalent across the arctic north polar region and obviously including therefore greenland iceland what is that this is like a superconductor. Look at it. It's got the crown on it. That's a superconductor with the copper. Man, we got to catch up. We are behind. Spitsbergen and Northern Russia. Mm. So 
it's it's like there had to be this this complete state of progressive deletion a complete erasing this was this was an actual this was an actual um what they use for the airships you'll see the airship fly right up it'll connect the dot on the top of it i just never seen one in such good quality they'll just come around i don't know if they got to touch this ball or the top i don't know but the airship will come hover right here I don't know if it's magnetic or what, and it just charge up like a wireless charger for your phone. You know how you set your phone on the charger and wire, wirelessly charge? It That's the same principle I believe was going on here with those ancient airships. It just is, it, it looks like you can go see this one. Like they still got it. They haven't got to this one yet. I would love to be there at the World Fair just to see the lights, the different buildings. What, what do we have to look forward now? You know, besides kicking in with family and, you know, events, we, we don't got no World Fairs popping off. Best we got is Cedar Point. We got zoos. We got museums. You know, it's look at that, man. How tight would that be to walk around with your family holding hands, eating exotic foods? You know, it's just. I'm starting to believe we're definitely going backwards now. You know, I used to think, oh, man, these new computers, these new cars, you know, how cool. Nah, that ain't it, bro. We are officially going backwards, my guy. The, the classiness, the elegance the actual care for artistic architecture when they were building you know their buildings meant something they just didn't throw it up because it, it saved money or it was a great price they threw those boys up with a meaning a purpose those statues the golden statues you know it they had some type of meaning the meaning might have not been good or bad but at least they had an artistic expression is the point i'm trying to get across Oh, that was crazy. Yeah, this is AI. All right, y'all, that's it for today's video, man. If you made it this far, put the 100% great video. When you put the 100% great video, it really helps the algorithm out in the comments and it helps this video get out to the masses. And I thank you to all my supporters that be liking, subscribing. Shout out to the notification gang that you hit that bell and hit all, notificate all. So as soon as I drop a video, you, you right there on the spot, man. The video don't even play and I'll be hitting like, I'll be like, dang, you know. Thank you, man. I appreciate that, man. My fault I went on a little tangent on this one. Normally, I have them lined up and, you know, I, I, I let them go back to back. You know, my bad, y'all. I, I wanted to talk about it, man. I'm going to try to get those two dudes, man, in an interview or something, man. Get like a live stream going with them, man, because they were extremely knowledgeable how they were talking about the different glass structure of the courts on the churches. Um, how, we, how the information he had on the pillars you know it was it was a lot and and to be honest with you guys this is a longer video and there's still more i wanted to say i get to the end of these videos and be like damn i missed that that and that 
you know it was damn near four things i missed you know it's but again man i only get 24 hours in a day and this video already an hour long i gotta chop this boy up i got no team or nothing it's just your boy you know i do this you know full time and i thank everyone that help help support me and um yeah i'm gonna keep trying my best to deliver this content for you and i i just want to say thank you so much it means a lot to me um drop in the comments what you think about this video and i'll see you guys tomorrow on the next creepy and scary tiktok reaction video peace out unveiling the creepiest and strangest tiktoks ever part two these videos make you question everything. They are for entertainment purposes only. I'm Jesky Chuck. Let's dive into these waters. Creepy and scary TikToks questioning your entire reality. With Jetski Chuck, hit that like and subscribe button one time for the one time. Charging the ether. This building's getting charged up. Where is this? What's going on, everybody? It's your boy Jet Ski Chuck back with another creepy and scary TikTok reaction video. If you haven't already, hit that like and subscribe button. Today, we're diving deep on the Mercury Rectifiers, the ancient Tartarian tech. Without further ado, let's get into it. Are you using? was the secret to free energy generating technologies of the old world. This is in part one of the many reasons why Mercury has been vilified in the mainstream. It is why there has been many pools of Mercury found underneath pyramids like the Feathered Serpent Pyramid and much more. History is nothing more than a set of lies agreed upon and their lies like to keep us held back. Rectifier. For entertainment purposes only, the Mercury Arc Rectifier is the key ingredient for free energy. Why has why haven't we heard about this? Why haven't this been taught once in any science class? Mercury arc rectifier. If we think about how energy companies run now, they want everything to be through them. There is no middleman. You must go through them. What if everyone can generate their own energy? How go ahead and tell the good people say? about this mercury rectifier, Alfred. Very well then, sir. Mercury rectifiers are electrical devices that use mercury vapor to rectify alternating current AC into direct current DC. These rectifiers were commonly used. In early to mid 20th century, electrical systems, particularly for industrial applications such as power generation and electroplating, TH, save so much money imagine everything wow look at the technology it was we've been lied to it's just so fascinating to think that vehicles were powered by mercury rectifiers i mean it even looks cool who wants to go to the gas station and spend all that money i'd rather just slap on some mercury rectifiers and get moving who knows what type of vehicles these things could possibly power and where they're at now. 
where do you think they're at now and what type of vehicles do you think they were capable of powering with these mercury rectifiers drop it in the comments below what you think they could possibly power with the mercury rectifiers it seems to be the main ingredient it reminds me of that terminator in matrix every time i see mercury it reminds me of that you know the robot they were fighting on terminator how that dude can go through walls and whatnot that's what it reminds me of mercury So they are making the actual Terminator come to life. Wow, it reforms itself after it breaks the bars. Watch it, watch it come back to life. That's nuts. How did you come up with the Terminator? Take us there in the Matrix and just... It was easy. It was a script in a book. The Terminator is the prequels to uh, the beginning of the Matrix. Sarah Connor is actually Neo's mother. So JC, John Connors, Jesus Christ grows up to be Neo, one and the same in the Matrix. The Matrix is in the future. The Terminator is the past, it's time travel, past, present, and future time travel. It's the second coming of the Christ, the evolutions of consciousness, man versus the machine. So the machines, the Terminator machines, hear that a child is going to be born that's going to terminate them in the future when they oppress man. Because see, it's a man versus the machine. It's God's children versus man's children, which was technology. This is really interesting. Artificial intelligence may seem like a friend today, but what about tomorrow? As we push the boundaries of technology, let's not forget the real risks that comes with it. How did, how did you come up with the Terminator? Take us there in the Matrix and just... That's absolutely fascinating that she created the Matrix and the Terminator. I don't know if you guys actually watched those videos, but... I have to go back and watch the old school ones because I totally forgot. We're connecting those with the Matrix. Man, that is out cold. The future generation of AI. Man, if we look at ChatGBT and all this information that this funneling. Oh my goodness. For entertainment purposes only. Hit that like and subscribe button if you haven't. We're on these dark waters. Let's go. The plotline for Terminator, it's actually pretty smart. It's like, well, how did Cyberdyne systems develop? Well, they were a military contractor and they were asked to develop a protective system for cybersecurity. So its primary thing is to defend against cyber attacks. And then in order to defend itself, it propagated throughout the world to keep an eye on things, see what was going on. They didn't realize that it was Skynet that was propagating through all these systems. And I said, okay, well, there seems to be something propagating through all these systems, Skynet. You need to stop it. And Skynet said, oh, you've asked me to destroy myself. You are the enemy. You must be destroyed. That's how Terminator actually goes. The plotline for Terminator, it's actually pretty... This is not Mercury. It's gallium. It's a rare element with no biological function. But since it's much less toxic than mercury, I can safely touch this extraordinary metal. This metal melts at 30 degrees Celsius, and since our bodies are at 37 degrees Celsius naturally, I can melt it by simply holding it in my hand. Just like the Terminator. It can be easily cleaned up with soapy water. Touching molten gallium is such a weird sensation. When you touch water, you feel that it's a liquid. It just flows. Gallium behaves like a 
liquid, but it feels solid-like to the touch because its density is six times that of water. Another cool feature of gallium is that it forms an alloy when mixed with aluminum. This means that gallium leaks into the crystalline structure of aluminum and dissolves it. That's why solid aluminum breaks down easily after being mixed with gallium. Gallium is widely used in electronic circuits and hence we need more of it for the future of our technology. This is that is interesting. We've been on this mercury kick so long. As soon as I see it, I think it's mercury, but it's actually gallium. Mm, interesting. This is what happens when you put mercury in gold. Here we have some mercury, which is the only metal that's a liquid at room temperature. What's cool about it is that it can dissolve most other metals and form something called an amalgam. Ancient alchemy, red mercury, gold, garlic, and a mirror, so let's talk about it. Red mercury and gold, is it the key element behind the ancient technology of these advanced architecture? As we can see here, red mercury is repelled by garlic and attracted by gold magnetically. When a mirror is placed beside it, colorless in the mirror, it has no reflection. It gives off free energy, overheats the metals that it comes in contact with. Many electronic valve devices have RM ampules found in the throat of the ancient Egyptian mummies, so it has healing prosperities has health benefits. Is it vampire blood? Well no, it's red mercury. The whole vampire blood repelled by garlic and them having no reflection makes a little bit more sense now. Tommy Truthful here from truthmafia.com. So it's pretty amazing that this vampire blood or red mercury is repelled by garlic and attracted to gold and doesn't even show a reflection in the mirror. It, it kind of really makes sense, like the girl said, where them legends came from. I mean, look at that. That's crazy right there. Now, I believe this red mercury was used in free energy technology. Just think, you're pushing it away with the garlic and attracting with the gold you could make crafts go. You could run a whole city on free energy with just these elements, the red mercury, the gold, and the garlic. And I believe these major ancient cities were doing this. You know, you go back to Tataria, the Hyperborean civilization, back to ancient Egypt, the real Egypt, because they give us a lot of propaganda where it is and it's not even in the right location but that's not for this show but they were definitely using this red mercury and there's evidence of this everywhere so i believe the aztecs the mayans they were all using it they were way further advanced than we are now because they were tapped into the frequencies of nature they were also using it when they died there's accounts of emperors with this in their this coffin. Archaeologists are afraid to open the tomb of China's first emperor. It's been 50 years since villagers digging a well discovered the site. Yet no one has seen inside the tomb since nearly 2,300 years ago, when Emperor Qin's body was sealed within. The emperor certainly had grand ambitions for his tomb, which spans 98 square kilometers and even includes his famous terracotta army consisting of 8,000 soldiers and horses. Just a little further on this pyramid lies the emperor's tomb. According to the historian Sima Qian, the workers who prepared the tomb and attended the burial were walled alive in the mausoleum at the end of the ceremony. 
so the secrets of its construction would never be revealed. He also states that the tomb is protected by a multitude of traps, notably automatic crossbows designed to stop anyone who ventures into the corridors. Worse still, he writes that the Emperor's bronze sarcophagus is surrounded by a vast river of mercury. We know today that mercury is highly toxic, but the Emperor believed it granted immortality. It remains uncertain whether the tomb will ever be opened, but officials prefer to wait for new technological advancements that will allow safe entry into the tomb without any risk of damaging the Emperor's mummy or the surrounding treasure. Subscribe for more video. So you see the first emperor was surrounded by mercury. Maybe it's connected to some resurrection technology. And red mercury in gold equals 187, which is the homicide code. Remember, Confucius told us, symbols rule the world, not the laws of man. The elites have a secret language of symbols and numbers. It's called gematria, it comes from Jewish Kabbalah mysticism. Now, who is the god Mercury? Well, it's Hermes. Mercury is the Roman god. Hermes is the Greek counterpart. And you won't believe this. Red Mercury and gold equals 187 matching MH370. The flight that went missing in transit, which would be connected to Hermes. And on that flight, there were several people that had patents to free energy technology. Hmm, interesting. Now, Schumann resonance is also in that 187 cipher and sound frequency. Then if you look at red mercury and garlic, you get 57 in Chaldean. This cipher is based on 1 through 8. It's one of the oldest and purest ciphers. The ordinal one is just A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, all the way through Z is 26 based on the English um, alphabet. But red mercury and garlic equals 57 like law of attraction. And what's it do? The garlic repels the mercury. It's the law of attraction right there. And mercury is element 80. Well, secrets to the universe is 80, guys. These are... Me hidden. truthful might be on to something. The red mercury... Is on point with how everything is running. The free energy. We've been saying that the free energy has been ran off mercury. But now we can see that the red mercury can now be repelled by garlic and have some type of motion going to get generate free energy. Is this without using the ether? This is the technique of free energy without them harnessing the ether, if I'm not mistaken. This is interesting. Pools of liquid mercury have been found in pyramids in South America and recently in China. Did these ancient civilizations know how to make gold? I believe certain governments are producing gold from mercury. Pools of liquid mercury have been found in pyramids in South America and recently in China. Did these ancient civilizations know how to make gold? I believe certain governments are producing gold from mercury. Pools of liquid mercury have been found in pyramids in South America and recently in China. Did these ancient civilizations know how to make gold? I believe certain governments are producing gold from mercury. Pools of liquid mercury have been found in pyramids in South America and recently in China.
Why do archaeologists keep finding giant pools of mercury beneath ancient pyramids, everywhere from Egypt, Mexico, and China? If you dig under an ancient pyramid, you typically find a giant pool of mercury, sometimes rivers of mercury. Mercury has endless applications in the field of energy production. The dendrolites in Egypt seem to be showing what's called a mercury arc rectifier. Here we see a recreation of the dendrolites. Within the light, you even see the serpentine movement of the ionized plasma. So let's say they did have a mercury arc rectifier in ancient Egypt. What could they possibly be using it for? Did you know in the early 1900s they already had electric vehicles? This was before the petroleum industry took over everything. Some of these electric vehicles could go 100 miles on a single charge. And what do we see right here? Wait for it, there. That would be a mercury arc rectifier. I'm becoming more and more convinced every day the ancients had electricity. You know, the more I do these creepy and scary TikTok reactions, the more my reality really gets shifted to are we really in the past and they were in the future if we go in terms of technology. What were they doing as far as the technology with the mercury arc reactors? They were generating free energy and look at us now. Barely making the electric bill. There was no electric bill back then. They had other things to worry about. This is pretty cool. This is mercury. It's pretty toxic, but it's magnetic. But what it can do is going to blow your mind. It has similar properties to water in terms of interactions with vibrations. That is because it's a liquid. But it is a liquid metal, which makes it very interesting. When you push a current through it, it starts to spin. Now, in electrical systems, if we put power into something, we can make it do stuff. If we reverse the process, we can generate electricity. Now, I posted a video a while back about Plasma Channel taking a drone with a piece of metal up into the air and connecting it to the ground with a metal wire. He powered a corona motor with this. That's because there's a ton of voltage up in the sky. So I got an idea. We plug one of these balls into a pole in the sky like an outlet. And we put some mercury in that ball and spin it, creating a vortex, pulling electricity into the ground. It's not going to make a lot of power, so I googled how to double that, and they showed me this resonator that can double it. So once we grab it, I'm going to put this right under it, and I made it this design because I googled how energy flows the best, and that's what it showed me. But I want to share this, so I googled how to send it, and it showed me this antenna. So I put it on top of the design, and that's finally what I came up with. We could even share it with like a greenhouse to grow crops in the winter. Or we could share with like anybody. We just have to make our cities look more like that, kind of. I'm about to file a patent so no one can steal this idea. This is pretty cool. This is mercury. It's pretty toxic, but it's... That is an excellent idea to generate free energy, even for your sight. crops. You guys made it this far? Drop the 100... It's a mercury arc with the fire. And it's been disconnected and it's uh, DC 120 to 20, plus 40 amps, and AC 30, 120. Blue, blue, greenish. It's beautiful all inside. They still use those things for the uh, subway in New York in some places hmm. to make the AC current into DC current. It's DC voltage. And... Uh, the way it was done is that you had the AC coming in on, on each of the sides and the DC would come out on the top and this would start the actual reaction. So in fact, it's backward. It, 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 it's supposed to be on the other side. When turn you hold it upside up, down? Yeah, turn, turn it upside down. Just be careful not to drop it. Just go slowly so the mercury doesn't slam in there. Okay, go okay, you see that? Okay, let it go like that. Mm -hmm. You see, this is the starting electrode. And you start the, the heart inside and then after that, it's a little bit like a mercury discharge lamp. And when the glues, the, the shots start, then you could put the AC in and the DC would come out at the end. Slowly in the middle Where, there. Yeah. This side yeah, or the other Like way? that. No, like that. Perfect. Now you see the way it fits? Yep. Bring it the bottom there. Okay. Okay. And the time to take it in. That's 
it was there because see, DC is there. Mm -hmm. And it says probably was hooked up to one of those. So now it was charging that machine in DC current? Yeah, yeah, because DC is oh, batteries. because the batteries, right, of course, yeah. This was the, what is the diode today? This was where the ancestor of the diode with the rectifier. The rectifier, the whole time, there was only one way to do it, and it was with tubes. Today they do it with semiconductors. No, they could, the same thing today could be replaced with a semiconductor about that, bi that big, about a couple of them, that's all. Well, this is basically how they were recharging their vehicles back in the day using the mercury rectifiers. Free energy. So this is basically how they were charging their vehicles back in the day with the mercury rectifiers. Free energy. This is this is it. This is a gem. They're showing us how they were doing it. Why is this the first time we've ever heard about this is the question we need to be asking ourselves. And how come we haven't developed more on this? Mercury seems to be the secret ingredient. Seems to be the theme. But at the time, the only way to do it was with a uh, mercury discharge lamp. That one is on a gimbal, okay? Okay, you see that? It's mm -hmm. on a gimbal, okay? Mm -hmm. So what they did, okay, you see in the front, if you, there's a knob there, okay, you see yes. the knob, yep. they turn it up, and what happened is that it short circuit the mercury, it, 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 it bounced, it doesn't bounce, but it wiggles right back and forth, I won't touch it too much, but it made the mercury contact there, and made, created a short, and that short, when it, you came back, it would start the hop, and it's, it's called the uh, initiator striking uh, electrode, and then after that, when the hop was started up, then the machine, this is why there was a start, a lever on the top here that says start it says starting mm -hmm. switch and there is the, the running switch and those are some of those well i use i mean some in the power station they use them in an old time power station uh they had some made of glass that were almost like three or four feet in diameter and i mean almost six six or seven feet high on a gimbal like that but they would supply like megawatts of power no? this, this is a small unit exactly like that this is the input. That's the input. Yeah, this is the power input there. And the DC was going, the DC is on this side. This is the uh, male part of the uh, connection to the baker's car, electric car. And uh, you could see that's that how you would the get your gas, basically. Positive terminal there, and the negative is in between that recess inside. And it was there for charging the batteries on, on the car. This is a, a, probably a choke, a, a reactor choke. Okay, this is this is the striking electrode. Okay, this this is a, what's called a probe start. Okay, this is the DC stage output. AC one side and AC on the other side. Half wave AC, half wave AC on the other side. Running switch. This is running switch, starting switch. Limit current. That's the reactant's choke? Yeah, to limit current. At the bottom. Yeah. <clears throat> Steve? It's a resistor grid. And, and I don't know if... Because I'm trying... Oh, okay, there's a, there a name plate here. Because I want to be gentle with it. I don't want to... See, there is a... There is a uh, That's a resistor grid? Yeah, and there is a rating on it. But I don't want to scratch it too much because it removes the... The importance of the part if you try to scratch it. it, it, it. So NASA told us that falling stars are basically dying stars or shooting stars, etc. But in the Bible it tells us how these stars that are falling are actually demons that were trapped in the firmament or angels. When they fall, it is because they have nothing else to hold on to or because they are being cast down or cursed. This is footage currently from Italy with stars falling from the sky and everybody's asking questions on what is happening or what's going on and they think it's aliens. For those who still don't understand, read this. It is also said when humans worship the creation instead of the creator, things like this happen. When they worship things like the sun and the moon, 
And it also is said that the stars, the sun and the moon have a firm place. They're stuck there for eternity, so they cannot fall. So look at this video, pay attention, and take in the knowledge for those who still don't Therefore, understand. Therefore, having heard this, this glorified the Lord God. And again, I questioned the demon, saying, Tell me how you can ascend into heaven, being demons, and amidst the stars and the holy angels intermingle. And he answered, Just as things are fulfilled in heaven, so also on earth are fulfilled the types of all of them. For there are principalities, authorities, world rulers, and we demons fly about in the air. And we hear the voices of the heavenly beings and survey all powers as having no ground or basis on which to alight and rest. We lose strength and fall off like leaves from trees. And men, seeing us, imagine that the stars are falling from heaven. But it is not really so, King. But we fall because of our weakness. And because we have nowhere anything to lay hold of. And so we fall down like lightning in the depth of night and suddenly and we set cities in flames and fire the fields. For the stars have firm foundations in the heaven, like the sun and the moon. Now, did you pay attention to what that said right there? For the stars Stay have blessed. firm foundations in the heaven. The truth about falling stars. Let's get straight into it. What's going on, everybody, man? My reaction to that, that could is be the only explanation of why it could be in the firmament for entertainment purposes only. Don't come for me. That has to be the only explanation of why they're pinned inside the firmament. This was written thousands of years ago. Let's go. Biblical prophecy fulfilled, man. Tune in. Let's get straight into it. So basically, there's crystal quartz bursting through streets, okay? And we all know how in the Bible, God said that he will bring the treasures of the darkness out of the secret places of the world so we know that he is the Lord. Look at this. And I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I am the Lord. Isaiah 45, 3. If you guys don't know, we are all connected to the universe, okay? We I didn't know quartz could grow that fast or was that powerful. I know a while back they had an entire quartz crystal cave, I believe they found out. This is very interesting. In the year 2000, the cave of crystals was discovered by miners excavating a tunnel for a mine in Mexico. The main chamber contains some of the largest natural crystals ever found in any underground cave. The largest one so far, measuring about 36 feet in length and weighs over 55 tons. The amazingly huge quartz in this subterranean cave have become this large because of the extremely hot temperatures inside of the underground cavern, and this encourages microscopic crystals to form rapidly growing much faster than we're used to seeing in cooler locations. Just gazing at these gigantic, beautiful crystals, one can't help but get carried away imagining what else awaits further exploration deeper inside these caves. In the year 2000, the cave of crystals was discovered by miners excavating a tunnel for a mine in Mexico. The main chamber contains some of the... Can everyone hear me? Yes. Uh, the first one right here, we call it the lighthouse, and it stands at 11 feet tall. The one over here, we call the castle, and that one stands at 14 feet tall in 35 feet of water. And the deepest part in the cave is back there, and that drops off to 55 feet. It doesn't look that deep though, right? No. Mm -hmm. The reason that is, is because just the first inch of water, that's fresh water from the water dripping in, and then below that it's all salt water. So it kind of gives it a magnifying effect. Very deceiving. And the water temperature is 69 to 72 Fahrenheit year round. Never changes. About 21, 22 in Celsius. Below, sound like mine? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Uh, the first 
one right here, we call it the lighthouse. Wow, I didn't know you can actually swim in those caves. That is a must see. Have you guys been there before? I definitely want to go. It just looks like like a scene straight out of Tomb Raider. Let's get back in these waters. This cave in New Zealand has the craziest pool of crystal you've ever seen. Nettlebed Cave is one of the deepest caves in the Southern Hemisphere, going down about 1.2 kilometers. The cave itself stretches about 38 kilometers and takes two days to get through. If you're claustrophobic, this is not the place for you because cavers have to stay overnight in a chamber called Salvation Hall. But those brave enough to enter get to witness these incredible pools of calcite crystals. This is a limestone cave, which is made up of calcium carbonate. And you guessed it, calcite is actually a calcium carbonate crystal. These types of crystals can grow in flowing water, but when a cave has no drainage for the water to exit and a constant supply of calcium carbonate dripping from the ceilings, you end up with this. This cave in New Zealand has the craziest pool of crystal you've ever seen. Nettlebed Cave is one when I almost passed out and had two panic attacks in a cave. Okay, so boom, I flew to Tucson for the Gem and Mineral Show. Now I'm a Midwest girl, so I thought, I wanna see some cacti, maybe a cave. So I found a cave tour, didn't fully read the description, just booked it, how bad could it be? That's when I discovered my toxic trait is I think I'm Dora the Explorer. And of course, I dragged my boyfriend along. Let's call him Boots. All right, so this is a colossal cave. First part of the tour, it's very cute, going well. Nothing too crazy, what I expected found some exposed calcite. I love crystals, so I love that. Also, we use a black light on the calcite and it kind of glows. Super cute. Now that's when things start to get a little sketchy because apparently it's called the ladder tour. In all fairness, it's clearly my fault because I overlooked that when I booked it, but here we are. So they had me in boots crawling through tiny little spaces, climbing up ladders over cliffs. The helmets, I thought they were cute. They're not for show. I bumped my head like five times. It was pretty humid, so that's where the panic attacks came in because I felt a little claustrophobic in the small spaces. But I did some breath work and I survived. Shout out to me. 9 out of 10 would recommend. Story time about when I almost passed out and had two panic attacks in a cave. It wouldn't be easy, you know, exploring a cave, but that's definitely something I would like to do as well. You know, it reminds me of those movies you always see. Those what, what if a monster might be in there waiting or something? You know, you never know. I don't know. That's just what be running in the back of my head. But anyway, let's get back into these waters.
I actually love minerals. It reminds me of that dude on Breaking Bad that was collecting all those minerals. You guys seen that show? Shout out to you. But uh, yeah, that's one. That's a trait I can see myself getting into in the future. Being able to identify and see different types of minerals. Who knows how many of them are really out there? You all have been asking for it, so here it is, Moon Map Reaction. By Jets Kichuk on creepy teak talks that will reshape everything. If you're following along with us so far what the moon map is saying that if you look at the moon it could be exactly the exact mirror of our world so basically they're saying the map of our world is a reflection on the moon that is what a moon map is let's get into it and see what they're talking about on this creepy and scary TikTok. It lines up for entertainment purposes only. It lines up. The moon map. You guys all requested this, the moon map. So buckle up and sit tight. We're going through the entire moon map on this episode. Hit that like and subscribe button. It cannot be, all this time, hiding in plain sight. A distorted, unreliable yet steadfast reflection. A quasi-photographic image of both our known world and what is this? This is the unknown world. Thank you Sturgios for all your work. Sturgios has mapped out each continent to the minutest detail. His work is meticulous. He has mapped time zones, seasons, flight paths and distances. The first true flat earth map. And it is of utmost importance, primarily due to the unknown landmass over here that Sturgios has named Terra Vista, after the Aberno Monte landmass of the same name. Why have we never heard of this land before? I gotta interrupt them. 
Is that where the Tartarians are? Look at me in my face and tell me that can't possibly be where the Tartarians could be at. Come on now, stop playing with me. If the area here is our known world, then the realm is absolutely enormous. But wait a minute. Sturgis' presentation of our known world here maps the five prominent circles of latitude. We see the Arctic Circle, the Tropics, the Equator, and the Antarctic Circle. And Sturgios has mapped the sun's concentric journey around these circles of latitude, mapping seasons and time zones with the utmost precision and accuracy. So what's going on? The sun and moon cannot journey the entirety of the land masses presented here because it would take too long. Does this land mass not have its own sun? Or perhaps the moon is not a map of the greater realm after all. But not so fast. We need to spend some time breaking down Sturgios' discovery here. How the image on the face of the moon was and is formed, when it was formed, and why are all questions that no one can answer. Nobody knows apart from the deceivers in higher places. But there are a lot of things hidden in plain sight that bring us a little closer to having a better understanding of this mysterious phenomenon. First of all is the nature of this image. It is a composite image. You are witnessing multiple images simultaneously when looking at the face of the moon. And these images are akin to a type of X-ray photography. There is also evidently a lot of distortion and optical illusion present in these images. No one can offer an explanation as to how this composite image has formed nor has anyone ever provided a satisfactory answer as to what exactly the moon is. And rightly so, for if they could, we would not be in this mess in the first place. But how this composite image phenomenon came to be is not important for our journey. It's what it shows us that is important. And perhaps it is best to leave the moon shrouded in mystery. Whether a natural or artificial X-ray photographic image, what is important is its composite nature. The image we witness here is a combination of at least two fixed images that are superimposed upon one another. The first image we are seeing, as Sturgios' groundbreaking work has shown over and over again, is a skeletal outline of our realm's land masses. So could he say that these could be in a different dimension is what he's saying this moon map could be. So we're seeing two different images on one moon. I don't know, man. Y'all going to have to help me out with this one. A to an X-ray. And in a way, way we have, we have never, never seen before. In this, in this image, image, we see, we see all, all the consonants of land, land we associate, we associate with, with Earth. Earth. Or what, or what is, is more appropriate term, term, the known world. world. Represented, represented by the, by the dark, dark areas in the image. image. And we, and we also, also see vast bodies, bodies of land, land and, and continents, continents that we, that we are completely unfamiliar with. Sturgis revealed, revealed that if that you treat the moon as a mirror image, image it is, and flip, and flip its image like, like you would with any reflection, reflection then, you, then can you can start to map out known land, land masses with utmost precision. And this is exactly what Sturgis has done. Mapping, Mapping the known, known world, world captured, captured in the moon, moon down, down to great, great lakes and, and deserts. deserts. The, the striking, striking similarities between our known, known world and mass, and that, and that captured, captured on the moon, moon are far, far too, too exact, exact for it to be any kind of coincidence. coincidence. It, has it has been, been right, right in front, in front of, of our faces every single day, literally. It is likely that no one has connected the dots here before, because of this particular unknown landmass. First of all is the nature of this image. It is a composite image. You are because of this particular unknown landmass, which Sturgios has appropriately named Lumeria. 
and this land mass is very important because we know that it does not exist anymore. Theories of Lemuria's existence as a lost continent have been around since the 19th century, with most plotting its location somewhere around the Indian Ocean. Those in the 19th century also spoke of another lost continent called Mu. They are one and the same thing. Old maps of Mu plot the land exactly where it is on the moon. And in 2007, Masaki Kimura discovered huge structures, including pyramids, castles, and roads, on the ocean floor, some way from Japan, a location very similar to where Lemuria is plotted here on the moon. The con We covered that. If you guys watched my underwater video, I literally have that on my title about pyramids underwater. Go back and check that video out. We might. Matter of fact, don't even do it. I'm going to make a new one in 4K. But anyway, back to this. Man, this has got some truth to it. Entertainment purposes only. And this really will change your reality. Because if you think about it, the pieces are adding up. He's got a pyramid underwater where the landmass used to be there. Oh, my goodness. This is dark waters for real. Continent sunk years and years ago. And this is very useful because it means that this image is not an active reflection, but a moment captured in time before the continent sunk. The second image we are simultaneously witnessing in our moon is that of the firmament itself. Yes, you heard me right. The moon is the only known official image of our firmament. The face of the moon is a composite image, and we have to separate the images to fully understand what we are seeing. We have the landmass of the greater realm, and this is one image from one angle. And then we have another image from a different angle. I can only illustrate this by showing you. This specific area of the moon is primarily what gives the phenomenon its spherical 3D appearance. The heliocentric liars love this area of the moon, and they have used it as a weapon of deceit against us. It is not a crater with rays, like they tell us. Look closer really look this is not the markings of a spherical object it is the apex of the domed firmament from within the dome watch closely this is the composite image on the moon presenting both images simultaneously and this is an interior of a hemisphere dome and now you see if you align the central apex point of an interior hemisphere dome, then it becomes quite obvious. If you erase the remaining vector lines of the dome, then it becomes really obvious. And once you see it, it becomes very hard to unsee. We got a lot more parts to this. Don't worry. I, I, take take your time. I'm taking my time with this one. This is I'm in no rush today. I got plenty of time. So go ahead and get you something to juice, get you some chips or something because it's coming raw. I have it hey, this is it. You are getting precept it for real, y'all. This is if you look at the moon and you take the two different structures, you got the firmament as structure one and you got the actual maps as structure two you form those together and you have the moon you have two different images i get it now and i see why y'all been yelling moon map do the moon map i got you and i see why now this is i'm seeing this for the first time with you i don't have time to rehearse these i just pick a topic i hit the creepy scary TikTok, and i say that boy for later that's my formula that's my process i don't like oh yeah i'm gonna react to this no we we changing our realities together huh this is there's four more parts to this i'm just letting y'all know this is a long one it's in depth um 
you guys like it when I do these longer videos. So, hey, let's get it in. Let's have fun. We kicking it, man. I got no one else to talk to about this. I talked to someone about today. Like, hey, get away from me, dude. You're scaring me. All right. All right. I'll back up. But y'all, y'all some riders, man. Y'all on these jet skis right next to me, man. We gunning, hitting the nitros, man. Let's go. It is a sphere. a sphere. That is an optical illusion. It is the markings of a hemisphere dome. And not only is this the interior apex crown of the firmament, it is also a reflection of the center of our realm below. This area of the moon lends its spherical shape because of the so-called rays that emanate from it. But as you can see, it is an optical illusion. The rays are actually hemispherical ribs stemming from the dome's crown. This area in the middle of these ribs is not a crater. That is the vortex directly beneath the highest point of the dome. The controllers have named this area Tycho. It was given this name, we are told, by Jesuit astronomer Giovanni Riccioli in 1651. If it was not for Tycho, then the controllers of our realm would have a very hard time convincing millions that they lived on a giant spinning ball. And like with everything else, they have used Tycho to hide things in plain sight. For instance, another 17th century Masonic astronomer named Pierre Gassendi called it Umbilicus Lunaris, the navel of the moon, which is interesting as North mythology uses the same simile of the navel to describe Virgilmir, the whirlpool in the center of our realm. Arthur C. Clarke's Space Odyssey, one of the most famous science fiction novels of all time, features a crater on the moon named Tycho. In the novel, scientists find that there is a strong magnetic field emanating from the crater and discover that it is coming from a black cube monolith buried 15 meters within the crater. A black monolith, a rupus nigra, a magnetic black rock. If you separate the two images, then you can see clearly how they are in fact two images of two different angles that somehow have ended up superimposed on each other. It isn't a sphere. That is an optical illusion. We do not see any oceans or water mass captured in the first image, which suggests there is some kind of X-ray radiation at play. We don't see the vortex at the center in the first image for this reason. And again, no one knows how these images were formed. But if some kind of radiation beams were responsible, then the first image, the land masses of our greater realm, were most likely captured as the rays hit the firmament. And as those rays were reflected into our ionosphere and began forming the plasma mass we call the moon, it is likely that the second image was captured. And that is the image of the firmament, of the structure existing above us. And that's why we can see the outline of this structure, the stars beyond this structure, and the reflection of the vortex and other great deeps below. The moon is a masterpiece of distorted perspective, a plasma embodiment of as above, so below. And it's going to take a lot of work and careful consideration in smoothing out this distortion to try and get somewhere close enough to create a proper map of the world we live in. And because the moon is a disc-like mass of plasma, the first image of the land presents some curvilinear distortion. And you can see it here at the edges as the land begins to warp and wrap slightly. A lot of serious work needs to go into creating a flat projection of this distortion. But it shouldn't be too difficult, because the distortion is only slight around these edges. And that's why Sturgios can map the circles of latitude, seasons, and time zones very accurately. A map without the distortion may look something like this. But important questions remain. 
If the central vortex is absent from the land image on the moon, then why has Sturgios plotted the land we assume is Hyperborea over here, which is not in the center? And what about all this other land? The sun and moon cannot journey above all of this land, as it would take more than 24 hours to circle all of this, and we know the paths of the sun and moon. We do not see any oceans or water mass cap and the big one, the one you've been desperate to ask about since uncovering the only map we have. Where is the ice wall that you flat earthers constantly bang on about? Let's start with Hyperborea, and here's where many flat earthers may experience cognitive dissonance. Although Sturgios has plotted Hyperborea here, there is no proof that this is the true Hyperborea. There are a lot of different land masses in this region, and we cannot be sure. It pains me to say that Hyperborea may not exist in the way we have come to believe. Mercator's Hyperborea is likely the work of the Masons to throw us off the real path. And this is what our purpose is all about, isn't it? Digging for the truth is difficult business, and as we dig deeper, we come to realize that artifacts we found before may not be as useful or important as we first thought. We all get it wrong, but stay with me, no need to despair just yet. It is very interesting that the Aberno Monti map was added to the Stanford University map collection and made available to the public in 2017, the same year the Flat Earth was gaining huge traction, and people were starting to wake up. It's also interesting that it has been arranged as a planisphere. The huge individual sheets of this map were originally arranged as an atlas projection, but David Ramsey purchased the map in 2016, and the team got to work scanning each sheet individually, and processing them digitally to wrap around a sphere. Perhaps the release of Monty's marvelous map was an attempt to keep flat earthers thinking Hyperborea was located at the North Pole, and to perhaps bring back any that were sitting on the fence and hadn't truly woken up yet. A very subtle act of manipulation. And the big one, the one you've been desperate also perfectly explains how wow taking all that in for entertainment purposes only the moon map definitely has some validity do your own research on everything but if we look at the past continents that could have possibly been there for me the underground pyramids they just didn't go underwater and build those pyramids underwater at some point that was above land and they constructed stuff on top of the land and then a flood or whatever happened got water on top of it so we're struck stuck with all this stuff that's buried underwater and they're showing us the moon map took like a ancient photo of that and then projected it p plasma on top of the moon <laughs> you see the boot hey that was tight and projected it on the moon you know it's man uh that's tight you know because if you think about it from a biblical perspective say for instance everything was made through vibration through you know i said let there be light and there was light what if that was the sun and moon when that was created that was a vibrational frequency when that took place so while everything was getting created First, the first vibrate vibrational frequency that could have hit the moon could have been the solid structure. So we got the land masses and everything. So when that frequency bounced back and hit off the firmament and came back again, that's how we got our second image. That's just a thought. That just was the first reaction that came to my mind. You know, I'm not the sharpest tool in shoot. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed but you know some stuff just comes to me and that just was my initial reaction you know i don't know but it is extremely interesting to try and figure out what really is the moon is it made out of plasma
And it is basically an ancient photography. It was the first photo ever, ever took. By God. By Yahuwah. It's the first photo ever took. Y'all want something? Here. Flow. In front of y'all for the first time. Y'all can see it. Until I come back. Until I send, send my son back. Flow. Oh my goodness. Let's keep it rolling on these waters, man. On flat earth. Till I send my son Yahushua. World of frequency and vibration right now. We will address the why this is all here and how it came to be in, in a later episode. Electromagnetism also perfectly explains how our sun and moon work on flat earth. As mentioned previously, the sun and moon are not spherical bodies of rock or gas. They are disks that rotate our earth much like a clock but in a coil-like spiral dictating the seasons and climates as they go. When the sun is beyond the equator ring, the northern hemisphere experiences summer and the southern hemisphere experiences winter. Inversely, when below the equator, the southern hemisphere experiences summer and the northern hemisphere experiences winter. But up until this point, we have not explored how our celestial bodies of light can actually travel in such a clockwork fashion. And as gravity is a hoax, this mechanism becomes even more mysterious. But again, electromagnetism and engineering holds the answer. We are told that the Earth's magnetic field extends from Earth's interior out into space, where it interacts with solar wind, a stream of charged particles emanating from the sun. We are told that the Earth tilts on an axis, and it is as if there was an enormous bar magnet placed at an angle through the center of the Earth. Mostly, this is all lies. But there is a strong magnetic presence on Earth, and it appears to be located in the north. And that's why compasses point north. On our flat plane, however, north is actually center. South is the entire continent of Antarctica, the ice wall. And east and west, the circular rotation around the north center with the south on its exterior. That's why it can seem that you are traversing the entire Earth when traveling east in a straight line. You end up where you started not because the Earth is a globe and you are traveling in a straight line, but because when you keep the compass pointing to the east, you are in effect traveling in a circle. Let's now have a look at electric motors. Magnetism, you will know that the opposite poles of magnets attract and the like poles repel. You may also know that a magnetic field appears when current flows in a conductor. Briefly connecting this wire to a battery deflects the compass's needle. Electricity creates a magnetic field. This effect can be used to create an electromagnet. This coil is the electromagnet in our simple motor. Connecting a AA battery, we can see the magnetic force from the coil moving the magnet in the compass. The coil is polarized. One side is north, the other is south. Let's start construction of our motor by creating the coil. Slide the permanent magnet into place. It doesn't matter which pole is up. Touching the leads to a single AA battery should cause the coil to bounce. If the coil is balanced and all electrical connections are completed, the motor should start. This is a commercially made DC motor. It is significantly more powerful and efficient than our simple motor. It accomplishes this with strong permanent magnets and large coils wound on an armature and a method for controlling the polarity of the coil's magnetic field. As you can see, electric current produces a magnetic field. Inversely, magnetic fields can also be used to make electric currents. It works both ways. What came first in terms of Earth is really a matter of the chicken and the egg, and we will explore this and the source of magnetism in a later episode. To understand how the sun and moon function as electromagnetic luminaries, it is necessary to look at the Faraday effect. 
Let's switch it on. Let's see what it does. Through this coil of thick wire, we're about to pass a huge alternating electric current. On top is a one kilogram aluminium plate. So we hear this noise. What's that noise? It's the vibration of the plate because it's vibrating at uh, two times the frequency of this, uh, of this, of this one. Whoa! <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> How does it do that? To find out, I've come to the place where it all started, the Royal Institution in London. This is the key to Faraday's magnetic lab. It's amazing that that lock still works. From the 18th century, it also became a storeroom, which is why it survived, and it survived intact, all the joinery, dark electromagnets, uh, exactly the same as Faraday. Uh, so this is it. exactly as Faraday would have had. That's right, yep. In Faraday's time, it was known that electric current creates a magnetic field. But it remained an open question whether the reverse is possible, if a magnetic field could generate electric current. Faraday answered this question with his most famous apparatus. Faraday's electromagnetic induction ring, which is this. In August 1831, Faraday wrapped two coils of insulated wire around this iron ring. By 1831, you could not go down to your local electric hardware shop and ask for it to have leakage of insulated wire. You had to insulate the wire as you went. And so as you pushed and pulled the wire in out of the ring, you had to insulate it. It takes 10 working days, which is a huge investment of time. But the investment paid off. When Faraday connected a battery to one of the coils, he saw a brief pulse of current in the other coil. And when he disconnected the battery, he saw a pulse of current in the other direction. He realized that current was induced in the second coil only when the magnetic field through it was changing. And if they hadn't been wrapped on the same ring, Faraday may have noticed that the two coils repel each other when the current is induced. And that's due to the interaction of their magnetic fields. Which brings us back to this. Through the bottom also perfectly explains how our sun and moon work dang i wanted more of that video but unfortunately that was it i try to find the full length of that video and post it on a future video but man don't come for me this is for entertainment purposes only man this is that man it's not looking too hot man if you believe in that you know the gravity man it's not looking too hot man looks like that book is winning What is that? Huh? Is that a giant tree stump? I know that's not a mountain because look how square it is. That's out in the stratosphere. What is that? Is that beyond the ice wall? Huh? I don't know. Y'all tell me in the comments below what is that? It looks, it looks like it's going out. Rainbow Comet, but explain the quantum force field surrounding it. It looks like a pure Kamehameha wave. That's got to be out of Thor, Isengard, Odin. <laughs> I couldn't tell you. Do I think it's real? Yes.
That's exactly what it is. It's hard to break that CGI because look how it's bouncing with the frame. You know, the CGI is bouncing with the frame of the video. So that's kind of hard to, you know, what is going on? What is it? I, a fallen angel, a, a powerful one. I, I couldn't tell you. Man, are you kidding me right now? Biblical angel caught on camera, man, what? So basically these men were working on a regular day on their shift and thought they seen a UFO. But I thought out the box, these look just like the biblical angels. Look at the feathers. Look at the eye. Man, y'all cannot tell me this is not a biblical angel. Come on. There's so much stuff happening in the world and so much stuff coming to the light. It's just in our faces now. Like, I don't think you guys understand how scary this is getting. I'm not in fear because I know the truth. But once you wake up and really start seeing what's going on, it's just going to become regular to you guys, man. And it's ironic. I just dropped a video on this. But what do you guys think? Is this a UFO? Is it a biblical angel? Am I tripping? Even though I know I'm not. Let me know underneath. But other than that, Keep your spirits clean, not stay pure, stay meditated. And most this reminds me of that dude on Super Smash Brothers. This is the boss on Super Smash Brothers. This angel looking thing, you know, as I'm telling you, man, they, they knew something when they made this. They was on to something when they made this, yeah. The moon phases. They say there is water above. H H H M M M M. I would never be able to mo look at the moon the same again. Look at all those old landmarks on it. The first ancient photograph ever took. One giant receipt. Bible says in Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Iron sharpens iron. 
the, the problem is a lot of these guys are claiming to be men are more like plastic than iron. The only thing they can sharpen is their little eyeliner pencil they like to use because now they want to wear makeup or they want to dress up like a female or they want to be feminine and masculinity is under attack. One of the greatest problems in our country today is men just won't be men. Be a man. Stand up and be a man. Do what we're supposed to do. Do the right thing. Raise your children in a godly home. Fear God and teach your children to fear God. Not fear him that he's just some being that wants to strike them down, but to fear God have a reverent holy fear like you would your father. Which brings me to another point. A lot of men have no respect from their children. They don't have a reverent holy fear of their dad because their dad's too busy laid up at the bar at somebody else's house when their family is at home eating supper. Be a man. Come home and spend time with your family. What about those that don't want to work? They expect their wife to do all the work while they just sit around and are lazy. You're teaching your children to be that. It's time for us to realize if we're going to be iron that sharpens iron, then we've got to be strong. We've got to be tough. We've got to be bold. And we've got to follow this. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpeneth iron, so... A man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. This is a short video showing the holy hole at the center of the flat earth, which is directly below the star Polaris, a.k.a. the North Star. This is also the location where the aurora borealis, positive magnetic energy seen as moon lights in the night skies, especially the further north you get, shoots out of the earth plane and can be seen in many countries that are closer to the center of the flat earth. We did see something protruding. If we, if you go back probably about 10 minutes ago, we de did see something protruding in that uh, stratosphere footage of that weather balloon. Remember that thing? I was like, man, is that a tree stump? We go back here to what my man got on this video. Oh, no. Where is it? There it is. If we look at this. Tell me that boy ain't protruding. I'd be fading myself up, man. I did it kind of low. I meant to, you know, I'd be, I'm trying, man. I'd be fading myself up, man. I'd be saving the 30 bucks, you know, but we out here, you know what it is. The faces in the sky by the moon this has been trending and going viral on my page. And the lady who shot this footage actually reached out to me and I talked to her and uh, I'm going to be tagging her in the comments below because she's the one that took the, the video, okay? But as you can see, videos have been pouring into my inbox. Many, many, many people have captured faces. Now, I do have to say that our mind and our brain tends to piece things together and make something appear. So I understand how you can look at the sky and find stuff in the clouds. But a lot of people also have messaged me that they've been having trouble sleeping, that strange things have been happening at nighttime. Now, I do feel like there's no coincidence, uh, no coincidences, but what I would like to say is normally at nighttime is when the enemy comes and sows seeds in your mind when you sleep. So even last night, I had a visitation and a bad dream uh, early in the morning. I had to get up and pray. So I want to say supernatural things are going on around us and this is the evidence i'm not seeing every video out there is true but i'm saying there's so many things going on that you have no idea open up your spiritual eyes and wake up okay so i'm here to tell you if you're having trouble sleeping or if anything is hexing you 
or causing you trouble at night, all you have to do is to wake up and to just plead the blood of Jesus and to speak the name of Jesus over that circumstance. So I break any bad energy that's over you right now. Next to you. Now the video is about the faces. How can she see the CGI that, y'all? I know y'all see that damn face. Yeah. Y'all better buckle up. So are you still Repent. About this moon video? You... Somebody else. Somebody else is recording. Yeah, there it is, the face. That's definitely a face. And the moon looks like it's... Yeah, I see it. You see it. It's coming off of the moon. Zoom in. There he is. There's the face right That's there. That's a big-ass nose. Uh, or anything like that. Somebody's forehead. Hey, it's not funny. We we in the end time. This for real, man. Y'all see the moon? Look, man. Y'all see the face, man. Look. Y'all see the face, man. This ain't funny, man. Y'all see that face coming from that moon. Joker face next to the moon. Let me know what y'all think about this. Can somebody please explain this face next to the moon? Watch this. Watch this. Watch so this, America. On. What the hell going on here? Because I'm tired of it. It's a whole face next to the moon look like the Joker. Look at this. Look at it. Y'all see it? Ain't that something? Look, it's not going to get no better than that, y'all. That's that's as best as it's going to get. What is it, man? Y'all put it in the comments below what y'all think this possibly could be. Oh, my goodness, man. Hey. They gonna quit playing with me. Man, y'all see this here? Come on now, I can't, we can't make this up right here. Look at that there. Shout out to Beyond Earth too, cause she seen the same thing this week too. Same thing. Who else we gonna see up there? We done seen a Joker. We done seen a Scream dude. Who else they gonna have up there? America. Y'all leave a comment below on this one. We got a whole joke of Who is that? Screen face. That dude is hilarious. We can't make this one up. Man, y'all see this here? Come on, man. Hey man, that's it for today's video, man. If you made it this far, drop the 100% great video, man. We're going to do something new. If you made it this far, drop the 100% great video. That means you watched it all the way. And I know you watch my newer videos because if you watch my older videos, I say just 100. But now we need 100 great video. Tell the algorithm this is what the people need to see. Y'all feel me? All right, now, man, this was a long one, man. I love these long ones. I appreciate y'all kicking it with your boy on this one, man. I got to chop this one up and get it ready for y'all. But as always, man, y'all be safe. You know, I appreciate you guys. This video is for entertainment. A disclaimer, this video is for entertainment purposes only. Do your own research on everything. And with that being said, time to go in hyper mode.
get out of here. I gotta go.